Hey everybody, welcome back. Uh, this is Mr. Miller here and this is Monday the 11th of May. Uh, so we're going to continue on today with our uh, topic 16 through 18 notes. Uh, we've got a couple more days of notes to go. Uh, we'll do those today, tomorrow, and Wednesday. Um, so we'll leave off there uh, with topic 16 through 18. We will have a crossword that we'll do, but um, my plan right now is to give you guys the rest of, or I guess the last two days of this week, uh, Thursday and Friday, as kind of catch-up days. If anybody's still missing some stuff from the from the fifth marking period to get turned in to me so I can update those grades, uh, maybe from incompletes up to uh, passing grades. So that's my plan, at least as of right now. Um, like I said, today, tomorrow, Wednesday, we're going to be going through topics 16 through 18 notes and hopefully finishing those up. So uh, without any further ado, let's go ahead and get started on that information. So we have uh, number 13 was where we had left off the other day. Uh, number 13 being the anti-war movement, or I guess we got up to this point. Uh, we left off with number 12. Uh, the U.S. opens the Vietnam War, which would be um, there. Uh, so we had talked about the different warfare that was used, uh, guerrilla warfare. Uh, America kind of um, forces their way into this war. Uh, remember the Gulf of Tonkin resolution after one of our ships is attacked in the Gulf of Tonkin right outside of North, or North Vietnam. Uh, so we kind of forced our way into this war. But again, it's all about this domino theory, which is pictured here. Uh, Got to end the... I'm like looking at my hair here in the in the camera. Uh, I don't know what's going on. I've got a weird spot there. Anyways, I don't know. We got this domino theory that uh, ends up uh, kind of pushing us to get involved. So how does America kind of respond as we get involved in this thing? Uh, well, there is, as number 13 says, an anti-war movement. So an anti-war movement, a movement that is uh, kind of going against the war. So what ends up happening here? As more and more Americans get involved in the Vietnam War, uh, more and more Americans start to turn against the war, at least in terms of their opinions. Uh, so like I said on Thursday, most Americans at the beginning of the war thought the war was a good idea, thought we, des or thought we needed to be in there and fighting in it. Uh, but as more and more Americans start to get involved and start to fight and die, uh, we end up with uh, a large number of Americans who start to say, you know, maybe Vietnam is not something that we want to do. Uh, maybe we should not be involved in this. And there's kind of a conflict that goes on here, as is noted in these two pictures. On one side here, you've got uh, a couple of, uh, I guess, a handful of ladies, uh, and they are holding a sign, uh, let's demand victory in Vietnam. Uh, now, note the age of the people in this photo. Uh, most of them are over the age of 30 or 40, it looks like. Uh, there's some younger people. There's a younger guy back there. Now, let's look over at this picture over on the other side here. And it says, my son was killed in Vietnam. What for? What for, America? Uh, so we have uh, a mother who's holding that sign or a father who's holding that sign, but somebody who lost their, lost their son. Now, let's look at the... Uh, let's look at the overall age of the people in this picture. Uh, they are all younger for the most part. Uh, a lot of them are very young people. So you kind of have this generational divide. Uh, young people uh, were more often opposed to the war because they were the ones fighting in it. Uh, and older people were more often supportive of the war because they recognized that we need to stop communism in, their tra in its tracks wherever possible. Uh, the old containment folks, the folks who want to contain communism wherever possible. So there are a large number of people drafted during Vietnam and during the Vietnam War. Uh, 1.5 million American men uh, were drafted. Uh, now, what ends up happening when you're drafted? You have to go and fight. Uh, but we end up with a large number of people who protest this, uh, protest this draft. Uh, you would have been given as a draft elig eligible man, uh, you would have been given a little card that would have said what day the draft was happening on and what your number was, and that was kind of like your registration, so your draft card. Uh, your draft card, uh, many people at this time protested the, uh, protested the war and protested the draft, the forced service. Uh, by burning their draft cards. And that was a, a common thing that people did, a common protest. 
Also, you have a lot of people who decide that they're going to try to uh, get around the draft. Uh, we call those people draft dodgers, draft dodgers. Uh, dodgers like the baseball team, if that means anything to you. Uh, so draft dodgers, they are trying to dodge the draft or get out of the draft. Uh, a lot of people, a lot of men uh, would move to Canada. Uh, I guess a handful of people did, not a ton, but uh, a bunch of people did. So uh, move to Canada because Canada is not going to force you to go fight in Vietnam. And if you move there, then you're not in the American draft. Uh, also, uh, colleges see a large spike in their enrollment. Uh, Colleges, uh, by I guess the end of World War II, there's about 2 million Americans that were in colleges. By 1970, just uh, 25 years later, uh, yeah, I guess that would be 25 years later, uh, there are 8 million people. So the number of people at colleges across, Amer or across America has uh, quadrupled, uh, multiplied times four. Now, part of that is uh, partially because um, partially because if a guy was uh, to be drafted, uh, he could defer his draft selection, uh, push it off for the future uh, by saying, no, I wanna go to college and I'm gonna go to college and then I don't have to serve in the draft. Now, not everybody who was in college did this, but some people did this to get out of going to the draft. So there were a bunch of people who, who tried to avoid going into Vietnam uh, by dodging the draft in one way or another. Now, I say colleges specifically because colleges become kind of the site of a lot of protests in, uh, protests in, I don't know if I've got another, yeah, I do, okay. Uh, they become the site of another, pro a bunch of protests in America uh, as the Vietnam War is going on. Uh, more and more people are starting to notice what's going on in Vietnam and they start to feel negative about it. Uh, and colleges are the site of this. So we'll talk about one of the colleges um, I guess in number 15 uh, when we get there later today. Now, this uh, war, this Vietnam War, has the distinction of being what they call uh, the living room war, the living room war, uh, meaning you're watching and we're kind of understanding this war uh, from our living rooms. Normal Americans who aren't going over to fight are involved in this war and they are seeing firsthand what is happening in Vietnam uh, because we're seeing what's going on in the war. Uh, they're reporting on it. There's reporters straight over in Vietnam and they're sending uh, television uh, footage back to America. And Americans are seeing this every night while they're watching TV. So this becomes kind of the first war that we've actually seen as an American population, actually seen with our eyes, um, not read about in a newspaper or listened about on the radio. We've seen it. And when you see something, you are more likely to be affected by it more strongly. So we'll talk about kind of how that all leads into a bunch of turmoil here as we get into these next slides. Now, real quick, uh, this picture over here on the left is another uh, protest. Uh, end the war now, bring the troops home, stop the war, bring our boys home alive is what, he, what they're saying there. Uh, these two pictures uh, on the right are both very famous pictures. Here you've got a um, I can't tell if that's a man or a woman. I'm not sure, uh, but that person is uh, putting uh, flowers in these uh, soldiers' guns. Uh, these soldiers would be uh, military police who are there uh, to kind of break up a protest. And uh, what they do is they put a flower, which is the symbol of peace and whatnot, you know. Uh, so you put that in uh, the barrel of this person's gun. Now, it's obviously not going to stop the gun. If the person, if the soldier needed to use the gun to fire, uh, that flower is not stopping anything. Okay, but uh, it would, uh, it's more symbolic than anything. And then here you've got, uh, down to the bottom, you've got these uh, gentlemen who are burning their draft cards in a Maxwell House coffee can. Okay, so you've got them here burning their draft cards, their little, little draft cards. So, uh, that is uh, number 13. So let's move on to number 14, which is 1968, a year of turmoil. Okay, 1968 happens to be one of the wild years in American history. And it's wild because uh, there's a lot of people who are going crazy about this Vietnam War. Uh, and it's leading people to do crazy things like assassinations. So we'll talk about uh, two assassinations in this, uh, in this slide here. So number, uh, the first assassination has to deal with uh, Martin Luther King Jr., unfortunately. So Martin Luther King Jr. was, again, civil rights leader, active in the civil rights era. Uh, 
uh, led the March on Washington in 1963, uh, led the civil rights movement for all intents and purposes, which we had talked about, I guess, a week and a half ago at this point. Uh, now, Martin Luther King Jr., uh, he becomes more and more vocal against the war in 1967, 1968, more and more outspoken against the war. So what he ends up uh, doing here, he stays in April, he stays in a motel in uh, Memphis, Tennessee. Uh, and so one morning he wakes up in this hotel and he's uh, surrounded by uh, his advisors and whatnot, or his, his uh, friends, his associates, whatever. Uh, and he walks out onto this balcony uh, as he's walking out of this hotel. And there is a guy, I believe the guy was on the roof of an adjoining building off to the side. Uh, and the guy shoots Martin Luther King Jr. and he ends up dying. Uh, so this picture here was uh, taken, uh, this picture of Martin Luther King Jr. here, standing here, uh, taken just moments right before, uh, right before he got shot and killed. So Martin Luther King Jr. died, kind of leaves the civil rights era up in turmoil, uh, and it is, uh, it is not, um, not a good spot, obviously, when, when the leader of the movement ends up uh, being killed. Now, uh, Sadly, moving on from Martin Luther King Jr., uh, there was uh, a president at the time. His name was uh, Lyndon B. Johnson. We've talked about him. Uh, you've researched his great society. We've been mentioning him for like the last week uh, and spending time with him. Now, Martin Luther King Jr., he or not Martin Luther King Jr., Lyndon B. Johnson, sorry. Uh, Lyndon B. Johnson was fairly unpopular by the time his reelection came around in 1968. Uh, he had pushed us into the Vietnam War, and the Vietnam War was growing in unpopularity as, uh, as the days went by. So Johnson decides, you know what, I'm not going to run for re-election. I've served for uh, five and a half years at this point, five years, because uh, he served the end of JFK's term, because he was the vice president when JFK was assassinated, and then he served a full term of his own. So he says, I'm not going to run again. Uh, instead, I'm just going to let whoever run because I'm probably not going to win anyways. So um, who ends up running? Uh, the, uh, there's a bunch of people who end up running for the Democrats, but the most popular or the most famous one uh, and the one that we remember the most, uh, his name is Robert F. Kennedy. Robert F. Kennedy. Uh, we call him RFK, RFK, uh, just like we call John F. Kennedy John, or JFK. Uh, this is RFK, Robert F. Kennedy. Uh, Robert F. Kennedy, you guessed it, is John F. Kennedy's brother, okay? RFK, Robert F. Kennedy was uh, active in John F. Kennedy's administration. He was the Attorney General, I believe, if I'm remembering correctly. Uh, so Robert F. Kennedy uh, is running for the Democrats, and he stands a pretty good shot. He's gaining in popularity, gaining in popularity. There's another guy who runs, um, I think his name is Herbert Humphreys, if I'm, or Hubert Humphrey, if I'm remembering correctly. Uh, we don't really need to remember him specifically, but uh, RFK is gaining support, gaining support, gaining support. He ends up winning the primary in California, which is the biggest state in the country or one of the biggest states in the country at this point. Um, the night that he wins this uh, election, uh, he ends up, uh, the night that he wins this primary election against the rest of the Democrats, uh, he ends up getting assassinated uh, in the uh, basement uh, or in the kitchen of the hotel that he was staying at, in the hotel that he was uh, speaking at, giving his uh, speech as his like headquarters in California. So he ends up getting assassinated. Uh, so this this bright, shining guy, RFK, John F. Kennedy's brother, he's going to unite the Democratic Party. Uh, he ends up uh, getting assassinated and throwing this whole thing into turmoil. So the Democrats don't know what they're going to do uh, in terms of nominating anybody. They have a convention in uh, Chicago that ends up being like there's riots. There's all sorts of things that are going on when people are not not happy with who they're going to nominate as president. Uh, so so in um, in Chicago that's happening. And so the Democrats are in turmoil, which leads uh, leads the Republican to win. Uh, and the Republican here, uh, we've talked about him before, his name is Richard Nixon, Richard Nixon. Uh, Richard Nixon, interestingly enough, ran an unsuccessful campaign against uh, John F. Kennedy back in 1960. Uh, remember the television campaign, I was talking about the debate where he was all sweaty and John F. Kennedy was like cool as a cucumber. Uh, we had talked about that, uh, I guess this was um, last week? Was this last week? Uh, 
I think this was last week. Yeah, last Monday we talked about that. So um, Richard Nixon wins this time as the Republican. Okay, and we remember Richard Nixon for uh, a scandal that we'll talk about later on in the week. Now, uh, with Nixon being uh, president here, uh, he ends up uh, he ends up kind of saying, you know, I want to end the Vietnam War. But in the process, he needs to expand the Vietnam War to uh, try to bring it to a safe end. So we're on to number 15 here. Uh, Richard Nixon ends up invading a neighboring country of Vietnam called Cambodia. Uh, Cambodia was housing a lot of the communist fighters, the Viet Cong fighters uh, in uh, Vietnam, but they were hiding out in Cambodia, which was just next door to Vietnam. I believe I can actually find a picture here for you. Uh, let me go back here to the map of Vietnam. Where is the map of Vietnam? Yeah, so Cambodia is pictured right here, uh, right next door, Cambodia. So uh, the launch of this uh, invasion in Cambodia, uh, this starts in 1970, and this prompts a lot more protests and a lot more uh, focus on what is going on here in the war. We were supposed to be leaving this war, and now we're ramping it up again. Uh, it's kind of confusing. So there is a set of protests that are some of the most famous protests that we've ever had in America, and they are no notorious, really. Uh, they were protests at a college in Ohio. Uh, the college was called Kent State, Kent State, uh, Kent State, Ohio, or Kent State in Ohio. So Kent State, it's a state college in Ohio, uh, and Kent State is the site of, in 1970, uh, protests that broke out, uh, and these protests were some of the most violent protests of the Vietnam War era. So uh, what ends up happening, these students, it's a bunch of students who end up protesting, and uh, they refuse to uh, go to class, and they refuse to, they're kind of just rioting on the campus here. What ends up happening is the Ohio State, uh, the Ohio State uh, governor or whatever, sends in the National Guard, uh, and they come in with tear gas, and uh, you can see here they've got tear gas and rifles, and they're they're uh, shooting or they're throwing tear gas at uh, their uh, at students there. And these students would have been, you know, defenseless students for the most part. I'm sure some of them had weapons, but uh, most of them probably not. Uh, needless to say, this ends up uh, resulting in violence. Uh, four students end up dying uh, as a result of this, or four individuals, maybe not all students, but they were all young people, uh, end up dying as a result of this. Uh, there was a famous photo, if you searched for Kent State, uh, Kent State Massacre, uh, you would probably find a photo of uh, this... Uh, I think it was a lady who was like shot and killed and she's like just laying in this street. Uh, and so that's kind of the image that was uh, sent out uh, around the world uh, and around America definitely uh, as, as, this, as a big symbol for this uh, protest, a big symbol for the Vietnam War protests. Now, the Kent State Massacre, interestingly enough, happened like 50 days ago or 50 years ago, like last Friday or last Thursday. I remember hearing it on the radio uh, as I was as I was listening to the radio, but it happened uh, just uh, just basically 50 years ago uh, at this point. It was it was early May uh, when it happened in 1970. So a uh, crazy time period that was happening there. Now, the government also kind of gets itself into some trouble here. Uh, word got out that we were uh, kind of being lied to by the government. Okay, there was a set of documents uh, that were published. Uh, they are called the Pentagon Papers. The Pentagon Papers. Uh, the Pentagon Papers here uh, were published by uh, a couple newspaper outlets, uh, the New York Times, and then I think the Washington Post outlined them as well. Uh, but they released these papers that were uh, top, top secret, uh, top secret documents about the Vietnam War, uh, published in uh, the New York Times from the Pentagon. The Pentagon is where uh, our military is kind of centered out of, just outside of Washington D.C. Uh, our military and all of our intelligence agencies are kind of uh, centered there uh, for the most part. So it's a top secret government account about how, uh, about American involvement in Vietnam. And this, pub this Pentagon paper, or these Pentagon papers, these uh, documents were published for the world to see and for all of Americans to see. Uh, 
Now, uh, Americans did not like this so much because, as they soon found out, they were being lied to about uh, lied to about the war and about America's involvement in the war. Uh, America uh, did not really know, uh, specifically leaders like Lyndon B. Johnson uh, and and other top ranking officials, uh, and maybe Richard Nixon to some extent. I don't remember if this covered him or not. Uh, but these guys were uh, basically lying to Congress and lying to the American people uh, to try to keep involvement going in the Vietnam War. So they lied to Congress occasionally and uh, almost never, uh, or not, all, not almost never, but didn't always inform the public about what was going on. So that's a dangerous thing and that kind of gets Americans all fired up about this uh, once and for all. Now, as a result of this outrage, uh, America really has no choice uh, but to try to make peace with uh, Vietnam and try to end this war. Uh, by 1971, two out of every three Americans wanted to get America out of Vietnam no matter what, even if it meant losing Vietnam. Uh, get out of Vietnam, two out of three Americans, 67% of Americans didn't want to be there. So uh, in 1972, Richard Nixon ends up making peace with uh, the Viet Cong, with North Vietnam, uh, and basically says, you know what, we're going to divide and stay divided. We're not going to try to uh, not going to try to uh, influence uh, North Vietnam anymore. So you guys can keep being communist, and we are going to uh, kind of do our own thing in the South. And South Vietnam is going to be democratic. So we've got this agreement, this this peace agreement that we agree that we kind of get to. So America, we remove all of our troops or almost all of our troops from Vietnam, which was good. That's what we wanted. Okay, we're out. Problem was, this peace did not last. Okay, North Vietnam and South Vietnam did not last uh, in their peace agreement. So. Uh, Basically, North Vietnam ends up invading South Vietnam, and without America there holding things down, uh, North Vietnam kind of overruns South Vietnam and uh, takes it over. Now, the final straw here is the capital of South Vietnam, uh, which is a city called uh, Saigon, a uh, city called Saigon. So Saigon ends up getting taken over by the uh, North Vietnamese and the, uh, I guess, the communist Viet Cong fighters. This happened in uh, 1975. So this picture here, uh, that is uh, pictured here with this helicopter on top of this roof, uh, the United States still had an embassy uh, in Vietnam, uh, in South Vietnam specifically, and when the uh, Viet Cong come in, the North Vietnamese uh, soldiers come in and break into uh, Saigon and take it over, uh, there is kind of a mass exodus, mass exodus uh, kind of extraction of American diplomats and uh, anybody who is sympathetic towards the Americans. Uh, they all climbed up on this roof and helicopters got them out of there. Uh, for the most part, some of them were kind of forced to stay, but for the most part, they got they got a lot of people out there as the communists were taking over the city. So this is a, a famous photo in itself. They're bringing people out of uh, South Vietnam right as the communists are taking it over. Now, um, I guess uh, some results of this. Uh, America spends a lot of money on uh, the Vietnam War. Uh, they spend a lot of money here, almost, uh, I mean, not as much money as some of these other things, but not as much money as World War II or the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, but the same amount of money as Korea, um, more money than the Persian Gulf War, all that stuff. So uh, we're spending a lot of money here, don't want to be involved, and that's part of the reason why we get out. Uh, also, you have, do I have another slide here? No, I do not. Okay, I don't want to go on to that one yet. So also, there's a lot of people, a lot of Americans who end up dying in this war. Uh, 58,000 Americans died in Vietnam, 58,000. Uh, 300,000 uh, were wounded. So 58,000 died, 300,000 were wounded. Now, uh, the Viet Cong uh, and the Vietnamese, uh, Vietnamese on both sides, uh, their death toll was astronomical. Uh, Two million Vietnamese soldiers uh, on both sides, the North Vietnamese and South Vietnamese, two million uh, died. Uh, so that was a massive, massive death toll on their account or on their uh, sides. Uh, but we also had a, had a death toll that was uh, very 
um, I don't know, sizable and unfortunate. Now, uh, when these Americans returned, there were about 2.5 million, 2.5 million Americans who returned back from uh, Vietnam. And when they return back, these soldiers, these veterans, they are not greeted with uh, the fanfare and the uh, prestige that veterans usually have. When a veteran comes back, usually you support a veteran and you like to, uh, you like to show them that they're valued as Americans. The problem was, at this point, most Americans didn't like the war, uh, so the veterans in the Vietnam War end up kind of uh, becoming the scapegoat for all of that fear and all of that uh, kind of uh, angry anger, uh, all of that anger. So uh, they end up getting uh, basically forgotten about, uh, these veterans. Um, they have had to work very, very hard to get the supplies and get the resources as they come back, get uh, the trainings and whatnot that they need because most Americans kind of forgot about them and, and they kind of bore the brunt of the war uh, as a whole. Now, uh, they also are dealing with a new thing that we hadn't really have thought about before uh, called PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. Uh, so PTSD is a real thing and a lot of soldiers and a lot of people who go through a traumatic situation have that and deal with that for a long period of their lives. Uh, and so PTSD here, uh, we're really starting to understand that, that this was something that a lot of soldiers were dealing with and it was a challenging thing for them to deal with. So that's an important thing to mention. Last thing I will mention is something that uh, Congress did to try to prevent this, uh, prevent this thing from happening yet again. Uh, and this would be called the War Powers Act. Uh, the War Powers Act, basically the Vietnam War, it wasn't actually a war. Congress never actually formally declared war in Vietnam. Uh, basically, this was all just military operations under, uh, under the president's authorities in some different resolutions. The Gulf of Tonkin resolution uh, was the main one that we had talked about. Uh, so the, gov or the president, president just kind of kept doing stuff because they were given power by, uh, by Congress to do some military things, uh, but never actually declare war. So sometimes people refer to the Vietnam War as the Vietnam Conflict. Um, because that's, it ultimately wasn't a war. Now, the War Powers Act ends up limiting the president's powers to fight in wars. Uh, they must consult Congress within a certain amount of time, uh, within a certain number of days, uh, before, uh, before kind of continuing any military, uh, any military stuff, any military exercises against another country. So uh, that's a way that Congress kind of maintains that control and says, okay, we're not going to give you kind of free reign as a president to just go and do whatever you want to do against another country. You have to do certain things. Uh, you have to meet us where we're at and you have to uh, kind of follow our rules because we're Congress and we make those rules for you. So that's uh, kind of a side note here. So. Uh, tomorrow, we will talk about some interesting things. We'll talk about the counterculture, the hippies. Uh, we'll also talk about the feminist movement and also some different consumer things. So it uh, should be interesting tomorrow. So uh, tune back in then uh, and we'll see, uh, see you then. So there's, a, I think, a couple essential questions to answer real quick. Sorry I went over a little bit. Uh, I always have a habit of doing that. I'm sorry. Um, so, uh, I will guess I will see you guys back here again tomorrow. So work on those essential questions and I'll see you then.